Galatians chapter 5 is where we are. There's something about a fresh start, a new year, uh, that gives us a sense of a fresh start, isn't it? Uh, there's just something about it. Um, I don't know if you're a resolution kind of person. Uh, truthfully, I'm not. I, I reject it. My wife and I, every uh, December 31st, January 1st, we get into a little bit of a, not an argument, uh, we don't argue, but we get into a little bit of a, of a discussion about the difference between her and, and me in goal setting and resolutions and those types of things. And I'm typically not, but I do appreciate the reality that a new year offers of this feeling of a fresh start. It's kind of a, a time that, that I think we all ought to, and it's one of many times that we ought to, just stop and reevaluate life, reevaluate priorities, reevaluate actions. And uh, that's what uh, we want to do in church today. It gives us that, that opportunity to maybe make some adjustments, uh, to get back in balance. Uh, maybe some things got out of, out of whack a little bit in the holiday season, and we just want to bring ourselves back into centered and, and, and focused on what needs to be focused and where it needs to uh, be. And, and that really is why uh, we are leaning into, for the next few weeks, this series that we're going to preach through called Fresh Start. Fresh Start is our attempt to encourage you toward seeing the new year as an opportunity to reevaluate. My prayer in January, the next, this Sunday and the next several Sundays, is that through this series, uh, you and I together will evaluate a few things that will help us right here at the start of the year to guarantee or to at least set us in the right direction so that 2020 is one of the best years of our life. I want for you 2020 to be a year of growth, to be a year of faith, to be a year of development intellectually, spiritually, and in your pursuit of God. And we want that to start right here in God's word. And so for the next few weeks, we really just began to pray. And I said, Lord, what is it that uh, this church needs? What is it that we need in order to make sure 2020 is what God wants us to be, uh, in, to what God wants it to be, and we grow and have that, uh, that year that we intend to have here at the Fresh Start. And so that's what we're going to do. Galatians 20, uh, 5 is where we're going to start. And before we read it, uh, let, me just, let me just have you turn there and find your place. Galatians 5, uh, 16. Uh, in, in 1995... Um, there was a, we were in a, a place in our home where we liked to watch boxing. Uh, boxing was kind of a cool thing. Mike Tyson, I think, probably had just gotten out of jail, um, and he was fighting uh, this guy named Peter McNeely. If you guys know what I'm talking about, Peter McNeely was this Italian guy. He, he had no business being in the ring. He uh, never won, I don't think, hardly anything, at least nothing of note. Uh, and it was the first round of the Mike Tyson, Peter McNeely fight in 1995. I think, if I remember right, it was about 10 seconds in was the first time Peter McNeely was knocked down by Mike Tyson. And then they sparred a little bit more, and then towards the end of the first round, he was knocked down again, and then something happened that blew all our minds, and that was his corner threw in the towel. Uh, the, the, the manager walked into the rink and he said, it's over, we're done, we're done, we're done. And from that point on, as a, a young man, I just pegged Peter McNeely as a wimp. I just, it was him. So every time I see somebody give up, I'm like, oh, you're Peter McNeelying us? All right. Like nobody ever says of Peter McNeely, man, that guy was the man. He is scary, he is tough, and he is strong. I don't want to mess with that guy. Nope. Peter McNeely from that point forward was recognized in my book as an eternal loser and a, a weak fighter because now look I wouldn't say this to him just if you know Peter McNeely do not tell him about this recording okay because the man had kicked my butt but from this point on right here in our group uh, that's how I felt now what what I see by that is that you and I never associate power and victory with surrender, do we? We never do. You never look at somebody who gave up or, or surrendered, threw in the towel, raised their arms of surrender, and say, that's a person of power. Surrender usually means defeat and weakness. It never produces thoughts of power and victory. However, that is exactly what is true, I believe, when it comes to living out the Christian life. 
the most powerful Christians are the ones who are surrendered and dependent upon the power of God in their lives. And here at the beginning of the new year, there are usually a whole lot of resolutions. These are things that we plan to do or stop doing, things that you want to stop eating. Uh, or maybe you said, I want to start eating more ice cream this year. I just, I'm, I'm old. I want more ice cream. And that's great. I love that. Uh, but we feel like the turn of the calendar offers us this fresh start to start to try harder and work harder and be more disciplined or accomplish something that we've never accomplished, that we want to accomplish. And, and that's the field. And most of the resolutions, even amongst us today, are probably very physical and material in nature. Things like exercise, weight, and addiction or discipline of some sort. My desire, though, is that through the passage we're going to study today, we would see that there's more than a physical goal. That, that, that this year, you would have an amazing spiritual year. That your discipleship would grow, that your heart for God would grow, that your power would grow, and that you would develop as a disciple of Christ. I want you to see today the power, I believe, or the secret, I would say, that's really not, the, not so big of a secret, to having power and uh, growth in 2020. And that is simply this, to surrender and depend upon the Spirit of God. And I want you to see this with me in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. We're parachuting into the middle of a book. I understand that. The context of Galatians is Paul speaking of freedom from the law, that Christ came to deliver us from the bondage of the law, and, and that we have freedom in Christ to overcome flesh and sin and uh, the demands of legalism. And that's the whole point. And then he says in verse 16 of chapter 5, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these, these are the spirit and the flesh, are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. They're manifest, they're, they're obvious, they're evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law and those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we be uh, live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the spirit may god bless the reading of his word what a powerful passage it is and over the top of this passage, I want you to get and write down this big idea. And here it is, simple and straightforward. The power of the Christian comes only through surrender to the Spirit. The power of the Christian comes only through surrender to the Spirit. So, so really, the power to become the Christian that I want to be that I desire to be, that God wants me to be, that God calls me to be. The power to become that Christian requires surrendering to the Spirit inside of me. Now, now the Holy Spirit of God made you alive and you became born again. That's what the Spirit did. That was a work he did in saving you. And when you were saved, if you are a follower of Jesus and you are born again and you are a Christian, the Spirit of God indwelled you and continues to indwell you, that you have the Spirit of God indwelling you. And the Spirit of God that indwells you, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself in spirit now, can and desires to lead you and to direct your life as a Christ follower. It's a beautiful, miraculous, spectacular thing that those of us physically here today who have placed our faith in Christ and been born again have indwelling in us the Spirit of God. And every one of us have him equally and we never lose him. And this is his desire for us is that he would lead us and control our lives and bring us to power in our physical lives here on earth. The key to this actually happening, I believe, is, is a level of surrender and dependence. 
Now, I love what, if you want to write in your margin, Ephesians 3.16 says, Paul's prayer is this. Just listen to this. That he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Like if I had to take a, a, a verse for 2020 for us, that's what I want. I want us as Christ Church in Queen Creek to have this reality of being strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. That each of us as followers of Christ would make up this congregation and this body and we would be people of power, not because we're awesome, not because we're uh, strong, not because we're powerful in ourselves, but because we have the spirit of God in us producing through us. Amen, that's what we want. I think that's what I want for your home. That's what I want for your, your job. That's what I want for your, your church. That's what I want for every aspect of our lives is that reality. So how do we get there? What does it look like to live by, walk by? What does it look like to be led by? What does it look like to keep in step with? What does that look like for us? How do we live that way? And I believe there's three things. I just I feel like we need to pull out from the passage today that are keys or defining marks of Christians who are surrendered and dependent and walking by the Spirit. And we want to do that this morning for the next couple of minutes and just enjoy what I think Paul has for us in this book of Galatians. What a great study this is. And let me encourage you and push you and urge you towards a personal study of this passage. We will not exhaust it today, but we want to give you some things to get you started. And there's three of them. And I want to answer it this way. When I am walking by the Spirit, these three things are true. First, I bow under his lordship. I bow under his lordship. Understand with me today, please, that the Spirit of God is not your little secret, powerful uh, 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 tool that you get to use whenever you want. But he is, in fact, God himself. May God, in his grace and in his power and in his love and in his desire for you to grow and you to have power, gave you the Spirit of God to take up residence in you. And this walking by the Spirit demands that I recognize his lordship and I bow in submission to his lordship, bowing down in that way. Surrender to the Spirit isn't like surrendering to an enemy, becoming his slave as much as it is bowing to the spiritual power of God in you and becoming his tool, his servant, and being his, uh, uh, led by his grace and his hand in your life. Surrender is to stop resisting his leadership in your life. I want you to see this from the passage for a few seconds. Throughout this passage, these words are put together to package this up, beginning in verse 16. Here's what he says. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Now, before we get on to the next one, just think about that for me, uh, with me for a second. This means to conduct our lifestyle led by and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5.18 tells us, right? Be not drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. To, to be under the influence and control of the Spirit so that every aspect of my life is affected by the presence of the Spirit. That's what this is. To walk by the Spirit is to follow his lead. And verse 18 follows it up this way when he says, but if you are led by the Spirit. This means that we are being led along by the leadership of the God that indwells us. So, so we see what is meant is that the Spirit does the leading. This is going to be novel for you, okay? It's a brand new idea. You've never heard this before. You, know, you probably have, but here it is. God leads, you follow. That's all he's saying. God leads, you follow. I walk by the Spirit because he is leading me. And so what does he do? How does he lead us? Well, we're going to see, but God produces in us new and strong desires for God's ways. He leads us to glorify God, to obey God's will, to practice holiness. And he, as he leads, we are not just to be surrendered limp bodies, but to actively submit and follow his leadership, to be sensitive to where he's going so that we can follow him towards this goal of glorifying God and, and, and pursuing holiness. We, like sheep, are, are looking constantly to the leading of the shepherd the leading of the, of the one leading us. We can easily be distracted by our own desires. We can lose sight of the leadership of the shepherd, but he as our leader, the Holy Spirit, he in, takes the initiative in us. This is an act of grace. 
Oh man, this is awesome that he asserts his desires in us against those of the flesh. And he forms within us holy and heavenly desires, desires of things that we didn't have prior to knowing Christ. He puts a gentle but, but, but powerful pressure upon us, often called conviction or the moving of the spirit. And our job, our goal, our purpose is to yield to his direction and his control because we are bowed under his lordship in our lives. Look with me again at verse 25. I know we're, we're bookending this passage. We're gonna go back to the middle and feel out the meat, but he starts by saying, let us walk by the spirit. In the middle of the passage, verse 18, he says, if you are led by the spirit, and then in verse 25, he says it this way, if we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us, let us fall in line is the idea. That's the, the idea of keeping in step. It, it literally means to walk in a straight line, to proceed in a row, to follow someone uh, in someone's footsteps. So here's what Paul is saying. The spirit leads and we walk by him and in following him. If he has made us alive, then we follow in line with the direction that he's going. That's our purpose. That's our goal. Now, I have the, uh, the beautiful, awesome, incredibly trying, patient, giving opportunity to coach my son's little league baseball team this past couple of months. And I'm telling you, um, I, there, I thought pastoring a church tried my patience until I got on the field with 13 seven-year-olds and I tried to teach them baseball. It was unbelievable. And one of the things I figured we would do, I, mean, I didn't know, I thought this would be a good idea, is I just said, hey guys, let's, let's take a jog. Now, Seven-year-olds, I guess, don't really need to jog. It's not like they're stretching muscles, right? They can bend over and turn into pretzels and everything else. But I figured, let's run. But one of the things I wanted to do is run together. So here's what I said. I said, guys, here's the deal. I'm going to run towards that tree. I just want you to follow me. It was unbelievable. Like, like I said, guys, look, I get you're seven, and you're probably uh, boys and completely illiterate, but all I want you to do is follow me, right? I didn't say that, but... That's what I was feeling. Just follow me. Just, I'm going that way. Just get behind me and let's go. And sure enough, little, I won't say his name because you might know him. He said he wanted to race me. And I'm like, I ain't racing you, boy. You'll beat me. And then there's be total shame. And just follow me. That's all I want you to do. And next thing I know, a boy was off wandering in the mud puddle over there. And another kid was chasing a butterfly over here. And I'm like, dude, just follow me. I'm running this way. I wonder sometimes because that's the picture that the spirit goes. And the spirit's running. And he's saying, let's go. I'm running this way. We're running towards God. We're running towards his glory. We're running towards desires. And so often we, we, we get sidetracked into all these other ways. And simply we must determine and decide this year that I'm going to stay surrendered to his lordship so that I will follow his leadership in my life. That's where it starts. That's what I believe walking by the spirit that's what I think it means when he says being led by the Spirit, and that's what he means when he says to keep in step with the Spirit. Listen, if you've been made alive by the Spirit of God, it's a miracle. You ain't done nothing to deserve it. <laughs> Poor English and all, you've done nothing to deserve it. You are not somebody that God got lucky when he found you. You were saved by grace. The Spirit of God made you alive and gave you a new life and gave you a new outlook and made you set onto a new way. And now the Spirit of God, he didn't just save you and say, all right, figure it out. He saved you. And then he comes down and he indwells you, desires to lead you and show you the way to bring God glory and find joy and fulfillment in this life by being satisfied in God alone. And our call here is simple. Surrender, submit to his leadership, walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. Dethrone self and follow his lead. Secondly, I want you to see that when I'm walking by the Spirit, I'm not only bowing under his leadership, but I am also, I battle against my enemy. I battle against my enemy. Look at, look at verse uh, 17 with me. Here's what he said, or verse 16, really. I say, walk by the Spirit, and here it is. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. When I am surrendered to the leadership and authority of the spirit of my life, I will find that I am actively battling against my enemy, which is my sinful desires. 
Paul says that the spirit and the flesh battle each other. Now, let's just understand, if you don't know and aren't aware yet of what the flesh is, he's not talking about your body. He's not necessarily talking about your blood and your flesh and your skin and your organs. He's talking about the aspect of your fallen nature, the, this, this tendency to commit sins, this nature that you have that's opposed to God and incessantly seeks its own end. That's, that's what you've got. You feel that. It's the urge within us towards autonomy and rebellion. It's this urge in us to be our own little God, accountable to no one, responsible to no one, obeying no one, respecting no one, running our own little world in our own little box to suit ourselves. That's all of our tendencies. We are selfish people. Flesh is the continual tug of self-centeredness and selfishness within each of us that fights to keep us from completely being God's possession. That's, that's your flesh. It's not a good thing. It's not a cool thing. It is that aspect of our nature that does not relish the things of God. Are you convinced yet? Like, I'm, I keep going. I got a bunch of these things. Like, I just want you to feel the weight that you're not a good dude or a good lady, that your flesh is broken. And, and that's a battle that you are now in. And the worst enemy that you have is you. You are your own worst enemy. Your flesh is your own worst enemy. Augustine used to pray, Lord, deliver me from that evil man, myself. Paul said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. Like, like he didn't say, I, I think most of my flesh is bad. He says, nothing in my flesh is good. And these lusts and desires of our fallen flesh, he says, are set against the, the, the desires that the Spirit brings into my life. They, they are opposed to one another. They never desire the same thing. When I first read this, I thought they were talking about Allison and Adrian, my son and daughter. I'm like, that's them. Like, Adrian waits to figure out what Allison wants, and then he chooses the exact opposite. And I said to them the other day, I said, Adrian, can you just not pick one time what your sister wants so we can just have peace? Or can you, Allison, you not pick one time what your, son, uh, your brother wants? Not son, your brother wants? This is what he's talking about. They never desire the same thing. They are opposed to one another. What they want is different. The flesh wants self-gratification. The flesh, your flesh, Andrew, Reed, my flesh, my sinfulness, wants selfish gratification, wants sexual desires, wants pride and arrogance and recognition. But the spirit of God in me opposes that and wants God's glory God's glorification and his uh, recognition in and through my life. They are opposite one another. He says, look at it again. He says they are opposed to each other. Now there's, there's few things better than watching a war movie when gladiators or these crazy barbarians line up on one side of a valley versus the other side of a valley and they run at each other and they just kill each other. I mean, it's horrible stuff, right? But, but that's the picture here. Yeah, you guys are thinking, this guy is nuts today, but they are lined up opposed to one another. The flesh is in opposition to the spirit, and they are battling, and they desire different things, and they are both active in your life. And so what Paul is saying is this, is that you who have been made alive by the spirit of God, you who have the spirit of God indwelling you are now in this battle, and the way to defeat these sinful and hurtful urges of your flesh is to walk by the Spirit. And when you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. You will not. And then he says in several different ways. He even says it in verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The law's only purpose was to control your flesh. But if I am operating in the realm of the Spirit, the law is not a burden to me. It's a joy to me because in Christ and in the Spirit, I am fulfilling the law. Uh, all sorts of beautiful things there. This is a, a, a powerful reality that when I am in Christ, indwelt by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit, I am fighting against the longings and lusts and tendencies of my spirit. I got a lot more I could say there, but let me just say this. Your spirit, uh, your flesh never produces in your life something to be desired. Never does. There is nothing that you in your sinfulness long for that will bring you any lasting joy and any lasting happiness and any, any glory to God. Your purpose as an individual created by God is to glorify God and your sin never glorifies God. 
God is never pleased with your sin and God is never pleased with your flesh. The only hope I have of defeating that hurtfulness and bringing God glory in my life is to walk by the Spirit, dependent on the Spirit, surrendered to the Spirit, led by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit because he is God's means in me to help me bring glory and honor to God with my life. And that's the battle that we're in. That's the battle that we're in. I love verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's a picture of your sinful flesh dying on the cross. And I picture it as it is, this, this, your flesh being crucified but calling for your attention, calling for your submission, even though it's like a chicken with its head cut off running around without life that produces anything, but it's still calling for attention and calling for submission, and it is dying, and we need to leave it there on the cross, crucified, dead, without any authority and power in our lives, dependent upon the Spirit of God. That's the reality of where we um, see this battle taking place. Let me give you one last point, and then we're continuing on. When I am walking by the Spirit, not only do I bow under his lordship, not only do I battle against my worst enemy, but number three, I bear forth good fruit. Now, now I want you to see what or who is in control of your life will be manifested by what comes out of your life. So, so here it is. You, your actions, your attitudes, your desires, your directions, the, all of these of your life all reveal who is calling the shots inside of you. If you are following the flesh, then the flesh is going to produce certain outflows. If you're following the spirit, dependent on the spirit, led by the spirit, walking by the spirit, then Paul says there are certain things that are going to, going to come out. And in verse 19, he calls them first the works of the flesh. So, so let's just compare. Which one sounds better? Okay? You already know where I'm going, but which one sounds better? What is the life you desire? If you were to define your life and say, that's what I want, let's see if it's defined by verse 19 through 21 or Verse 22 or 23, here's what it says. Verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So if I missed anything, it's all included there. That's what he's saying. I think Paul kind of gave him a way out because he's like, I'm done listing all these things. If there's anything else that kind of fits under those categories... That's included there. And he warned us, these works are the deeds of people who con are controlled by their sinful impulses. They are evident and obvious. It's not an exhaustive list at all. But he warns us that these are the characteristics of people who are not saved. These are the characteristics of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. So these are not characteristics of Christ followers. These are not things that are practiced by people being led by the Spirit of God. And these are the things of people who are going to spend eternity separated from God. But the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against things there is no law. What a beautiful passage. These are of the Spirit, so these are, these are qualities to be found in believers because the change the Spirit of God brought. This isn't a list of to-dos. This isn't a list of Paul saying, all right, here's what you need to go do and try really hard to do it. He's saying these are the things that come from a life dependent upon and led by the Spirit, and these are the fruit, singular, so these are clusters of fruit that hang on the trees of the life of the person dependent upon and led by the Spirit of God. And against such, there is no law. There's not a law in all of mankind and in all the world and in all of the Mosaic law that prevents these things from happening. Could you imagine if the law was passed that there's no longer any uh, joy to be allowed in this nation? Like if you find joy, you're going to jail, right? No more love. We're not loving anymore. Hey, stop being so patient. That's it. It's a law. No more patience. So what Paul is saying is there's no law against these. These, in fact, are the, the, the desires of all law, man and God. These are the desires that, that are uh, virtues to be produced in the life of the person. This is the life of 2020. This is what I want. I was, I was getting ready this morning, and I was thinking through this, and I was thinking about how each one of these would play out in my life. How would love look if I just loved people truly, genuinely, and sacrificially? What did it look like if joy was present, and peace was there, and patience 
And, and instead of looking at this and thinking, oh my goodness, I don't have patience, I need to try harder. No, the whole point of this is that these are productions of the Spirit of God at work in your life. So I, I depend on him and I said, God, help me today at church, help me today with my kids to be gentle, to be under control, to be kind, to be faithful, to find joy. So, so I know that when these are read, uh, when these are not present in my life, when I have no joy, I know that's not the spirit of God at work in me. When I lose my self-control and I lose my temper, that's not the spirit of God saying, all right, Andrew, lose your temper. When, I, when I'm not faithful, when I'm not at peace, that's not the spirit of God. That's the flesh. The spirit of God produces these things. Now, two things are happening here, and then we're going to bring it to a, a land and we're going to be done. First, Paul is giving us distinctions between what the flesh and the spirit produce in a life so that we can accurately identify who or what is leading our lives. So you and I can look at this and say, I want to know what's leading my life. If my flesh is leading my life, then the other things are going to be present, not these things of the fruit of the spirit. And then I'm going to make some adjustments and I'm going to go back to God and I'm going to get back into his word and I'm going to find some place on my knees to just throw myself again at his mercy and at his leadership and surrender my life again and renew my mind again. That's what he's saying. And the second thing I think he's doing is this, is he's given us these distinctions so that we can see the horrific effects of living by the flesh and the tremendous blessings of living by the spirit. What a beautiful thing that he shows for us is, He's not letting us figure it out on our own. He's just saying, guys, look, if you follow the desires of your flesh, if you live with, I want it, so I'm gonna go get it, then you're gonna have things produced in your life that bring you emptiness and disappointment and frustration. But if you will fight that, if you will depend on the spirit, if you will follow in line behind his leadership, he will urge you and place in you desires towards these things that he lists here that bring God glory, that make peace at home, peace in the church and peace in your workplace and peace in your neighborhood. And that's what he's putting for us. So if 2020 were a year characterized by and full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that would be a pretty good year, wouldn't it? That would be a pretty good year, wouldn't it? I mean, come on. Like, you're not, don't tell me you're like, I'd rather the previous list. Come on. That's the list we want. That's what we want. We want Spirit of God, do this. Spirit of God, do this. I want this in my life. I want this kind of production in my life. I want to experience love. I want to experience joy. So I'm not going to follow my own desires anymore. I'm going to follow yours. Lead me and guide me and show me the way that I'm to take. And I will commit to do that. We start the year with that. 50, 51 Sundays to go. We're going to start right here this way, saying, Spirit of God, move. Spirit of God, lead. Spirit of God, fill me. Spirit of God, I follow you. I commit. And, and tomorrow morning, by the way, I'm going to do it again. And Tuesday morning, I'm going to do it again. And Wednesday morning and 360 more days, I'm going to do it again. Spirit of God, lead me today. Take my hands, take my feet, take my eyes, take my everything. Use me for God's glory. Put desires in my heart that are against the desires of my flesh so that I might live a life that glorifies God and I find satisfaction in that. That's my heart's desire. So the big idea is simple, right? The power of the Christian comes only through surrender to the Spirit. The life you long for, the joy you long for, the love you long for, the kind of the peace that you long for, it's not in getting more accomplished this year. It's not in reading more books. It's not in getting in shape. It's not, it's not shrinking your waistline. Those are all good and do them. Go, get it. But bodily exercise profits little, but godliness has profit now and into eternity. And that's what we're dealing with. True joy, true peace. True love comes not through you white-knuckling it, but comes through you surrendering through the power of the Spirit of God in your life. So present your life to Him. Every one of the 360 days left in the year. Wake up each morning and find a moment or several to refresh your surrender to the Spirit. Make choices to deny the flesh and its hurtful and sinful lusts. Let the Word of God richly dwell in you. Let it feed you. Let it enable you with the power of the word, the spirit to enable to, to work in you, to utilize his means of grace. God's given you means of grace like prayer, like reading and meditating on the Bible, like faithfully attending the church community where we can encourage one another towards love and good works. He's given us those. Those are means of grace that we utilize so that we can be people who walk by the uh, spirit, not following the lusts of the flesh. Amen. I'm going to give you three learning to live moments, uh, statements that 
I really want you to leave with this morning. We learn here so that we can affect the way we live. We don't learn just to learn. We ask ourselves the hard questions. We ask ourselves the real honest questions, and we don't lie. We are honest with ourselves, and we learn these things so that we can affect, it can affect the way we live. And here's the first question. Ask yourself this, to whom do I belong? To whom do I belong? Verse 24 said it this way, listen. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who belong to Christ. So Paul was talking of those who have, uh, who have uh, been saved and in whom the Spirit of God has taken up residence. Is that you? Look, look, the, the reality of you ever getting to a point where you walk by and be led by the Spirit is impossible. It's impossible if you don't first belong to Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Christ, if you are not saved, if the Spirit of God has not made you alive, then He does not indwell you and therefore, living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, it's an impossibility. So for me to speak to you about being led by the Spirit, if you've never been indwelt by the Spirit, is, it's, not, it's pointless. And so what the first step is, is you coming to faith in Christ so that at that moment of regeneration, the Spirit of God takes up residence in your life so that you can then be led by the Spirit of God. So if you don't belong to Christ, that's your first step. Are you saved? Are you a follower of Christ? Have you placed your faith in Christ? That's where it starts. To whom do I belong? Be honest with yourself. Second, ask yourself this question. What is hindering the Spirit's work in my life? The Spirit wants to work. And so if it is not, what is hindering his ability to produce fruit in your life? Pride, selfishness, bitterness, lusts of your flesh. What is it? What is it that is keeping him from freely flowing and freely producing in your life? And let's deal with that. Let's address that. Identify those things. Leave them on the cross to die. Repent of them. That's what crucifixion of the flesh is. It's total and utter final repentance to say, I'm done with it. I'm done with my pride. I'm done with my selfish pursuits and desires. I want him and his leadership in my life only. So don't do that which is hindering the Spirit's work in your life. And then, and then third, the question is this. How does surrender to the Spirit affect my mission? When the Spirit is in control of your life, you will be a person who lives for others. All of the things that he says he produces are relational in nature and, and very uh, appealing in relationship with one another. They are for the purpose of living on mission for others. And the Bible tells us that when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you shall be witnesses of him. You shall be a representative of him. You shall witness of who he is and what he's done in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is in our neighborhood and throughout our world. That's what the spirit does when we are surrendered to him in our life. So the question is, is am I surrendering to the spirit of God in his leadership so that I then can live on mission for the glory of God? And so here at the beginning of our year, let's just, let's just fall on our face before God, even today, and just say, God, Spirit of God, I give my life, I give myself, I give my will to you, and I ask you to lead me. I submit, I bow to your lordship. I, I, I battle the flesh. I'm resisting the flesh. I'm committing to it. Let's start this year this way, huh? Let's have a fresh start. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you that you saved us that you made us alive by your spirit, that you renewed in us, uh, that, you, that you placed in us a desire for righteousness and holiness, for right things and godly things. Thank you for giving us uh, the, the, the indwelling of the spirit. God, we pray today, we commit today, we, we pray out today, your church, your body, your people, here's, here's what we say together. I believe we, we feel this together. We corporately wanna say this, God, Spirit of God, move, lead us. We, we surrender, we submit, we dethrone ourselves. Take the lead, take the charge, control us. Help us to, to see where you're leading and, and, and then fall in step behind you. Help us to trust that you will produce in us the fruit that, that really is the life that glorifies God and that we desire.